Okay, good morning. Uh, this is GEO 319 Surface Processes lecture for Friday, April 24th. Um, so today, um, I want to start discussing um, geoengineering. So I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, pull up a PowerPoint, and then uh, we'll we'll start start lecture. Okay, so um, so today I want to accomplish a few very basic things, and and the first thing is just to introduce you guys to the concept and definition of geoengineering. Um, get you guys familiar with some of the current methods that we're using uh, for geoengineering right now. Um, and in particular, I want you to think about or to understand how this particular geoengineering technique um, is trying to modify a global um, cycle um, or what what exactly what geoengineering is trying to do so first of all um, what does what is what do you guys think geoengineering means I imagine that it either means working with the land to build structures like bridges or um, working to change the landscape. Okay. So that's a, that is a really good and um, actually what I used to think of as geoengineering, but we're gonna, we're gonna make a, a little caveat here. And that is that what you just um, described is called geotechnical engineering. Um, so geotechnical engineering is the engineering with earth materials. And it's almost like a subset of civil engineering. So geoengineering um, is, is different than geotechnical engineering. Any other guesses what geoengineering means? Okay, so we're going to accomplish my first learning objective right now. Geoengineering is the deliberate large scale intervention in the Earth's climate system in order to moderate global warming. All right, so uh, the main thing here is this is trying to engineer the entire globe and these global systems. All right, so first of all, um, it is daunting the magnitude of what we're talking about doing here. All right, we are trying to engineer entire global systems. Um, it's daunting and it's a bit scary. But um, if we go back to my previous lecture, we as humans are already engineering the Earth system and the Earth's climate. We're doing it unwittingly and perhaps not in the best fashion, but we are taking control of these processes. So this idea of geoengineering now is to start thinking about, well, how do we use our influence to be uh, more smart about how we um, how we engineer or change the Earth's climate. Okay, so so first of all, we're we're here. We've introduced this idea of geoengineering. So who knows or can think of any methods 
current methods that we might be using for geoengineering. Anybody have any ideas of, of ways that we are currently geoengineering? I heard about an experiment done in Arizona where they I think they were just going to try out what it would be like to shoot this specific type of gas into the high atmosphere to try and block radiation. Okay, so Wendell's talking about uh, maybe physically blocking radiation um, from the Earth's, uh, the top of the Earth's atmosphere. All right, so yeah, Wendell, this is, and everyone, this is a, this is um, not only something that we are experimenting on, but it is something that we're actively doing right now. So we'll talk about some of the ways that we're actually trying to influence the Earth's radiation climate. Any other ideas of what we might be doing uh, geoengineering wise? I, it's sometimes I'm thinking about processes that may just be like restoration that on like a large scale, maybe is that what's the difference between like, like could restoration be considered geoengineering, like restoring estuaries? Yeah, abs the short answer to that is absolutely. And there's a big uh, movement right now into trying to think about incorporating global carbon cycles into restoration plans and into large scale restoration, as well as into agricultural practices. So um, yeah, that's, an, that's another, another one. And maybe we'll get to some of those uh, shortly. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start thinking about some of the ways that we are currently um, uh, geoengineering. And the first thing I wanted to do was just go back and review our global energy cycle and review our global carbon cycle. All right. And think about, um, you know, these two cycles are very inter intertwined for our global climate. Um, and then think about how we can uh, engineer some of these, um, how we can perform global scale engineering of these two cycles. So we're gonna talk about um, uh, carbon sequestration and modifying the water and energy cycle. Okay, so, so let's take a step back and let's, here is a figure for the global um, energy budget. And there's a few, pieces here that we're gonna we're gonna look at um, but remember that the basic idea here is that the earth's temperature is not running away increasing all right and the bottom line is that if we want to think about the um, budget for the atmosphere we we have to think about what's coming in and what's going out so What's coming into the atmosphere is solar radiation, all right? So at the top of the atmosphere, the only incoming energy is solar radiation. What's going out is what gets reflected, all right? At, right as it comes into the atmosphere. And then what is emitted by heat of the earth, all right? So um, basically outgoing heat radiation. And basically these two are balanced. Um, the incoming and the outgoing radiation will be balanced, but what we're, what we are interested in is what is the temperature um, in the atmosphere and in particular, the temperature of the surface. All right, so the surface of the earth has a different budget, all right? It's a different reservoir in our system and it gets essentially um, its major input is what radiation comes in, doesn't get reflected, so is absorbed for the Earth's surface. And then the other major input 
is what gets radiated back from, through, from collection in the atmosphere, what gets re-radiated back to the atmosphere. All right, so if we wanna cool the Earth's surface, our main goal here is to reduce one of these two fluxes, either what gets absorbed, all right, or what, or reduce what's getting radiated back. All right, so that's, at its essence, all of our geoengineering principles are basically going to be doing these two things, trying to figure out how to reduce how much gets absorbed at the surface and how to reduce how much is being radiated back. All right, now, global warming in a nutshell can be summarized by an increase in back radiation, all right? So as we add, Greenhouse, more greenhouse gases, we're increasing this back radiation flux, all right? So we can either try and reduce the amount of greenhouse gases, or we can try and reduce this amount of um, energy flux coming into the surface. All right, so in principle, it's a really complicated system. But if we break it into these system diagrams and just think about very simply about these fluxes, it's really boils down to decreasing one of these two arrows. All right. It's really hard to increase anything out. That's a, but maybe we could think about creative ways to do that. I just can't right now. And that's not what we're currently doing. What we're currently doing is trying to reduce what's coming in. Okay, so the principal way that we're going to try and reduce uh, reduce this arrow. So what is um, the the arrow of of what is being re-radiated is by thinking about the carbon cycle and the principal greenhouse gas, and that is CO two. All right, so I want to go back and and relook at our CO two cycle. Okay, so here is our, our global carbon cycle. We have it both for the ocean and, um, and the Earth's surface, all right? Um, there's a lot of this stuff that's happening up here. So we basically have two reservoirs that we're interested in um, at the Earth's surface, all right? There's everything that's going on in the atmosphere all right, and really most of this stuff in here is just exchange within the atmosphere or the biosphere. And there's two sort of fluxes that are, I would call long-term removal or addition fluxes. So if we can get things into the soil, into soil carbon or into rock carbon, we are causing, we are pulling down CO2 out of the atmosphere reservoir and into the, into the rock or soil reservoir, all right? Similarly, if we, can get, if we can get more carbon down into the deep ocean, all right, we're pulling CO2 out of the atmospheric reservoir and into this deep ocean reservoir. So really, there's three main ways we can influence the amount of CO2 in the atmospheric reservoir. That is to focus on the soil carbon and rock flux. All right, so get more down into the, into the geologic system or get more down into the deep ocean. And the third way is to reduce fossil fuels uh, and, some, and cement, all right? production. Reality check is that we're really failing completely at this one. So let's try and think about some ways to um, focus on these downward fluxes. All right, so this is the basic idea behind these, behind most of the geoengineering um, principles. So 
Um, if we go back to some of Wendell's suggestions, well, yeah, putting something in the atmosphere that re would cause more reflection, that's going to reduce this incoming vector, all right? We're going to get more being reflected right back out. The changing restoration so that it increases the amount of soil carbon and the amount of carbon being locked up into the, into the uh, geologic system. All right, that's another way that we're gonna look at to try and engineer the Earth's climate. And then it's mainly to do with this sort of first arrow here, flux into the soil, and into plant biomass, but plant biomass is very transient. It's, it, plants live and then they die and then they get eaten and respired. Where we gotta try and lock more stuff up is down in the geologic system. Okay, so let's look at, this is a, um, you know, just a cartoon of some methods that are being used for geoengineering right now. Um, and we briefly discussed some of these. So, so what Wendell talked about was a reflective aerosol, something that we plant in the upper atmosphere that would cause more of the, our incoming sunlight to be reflected. Some people have talked about throwing up a bunch, a series of orbiting mirrors that reflect some of the sunlight. All right, so these are kind of, this one we're not really doing. This one is being done a little bit. Something that we will talk about today and that is actively being done a lot, all right, a lot more than probably any of you realize is cloud seeding. All right, there are, there are companies out there right now, their whole job is cloud seeding. And there's a variety of people who are doing cloud seeding right now, including state of Wyoming, state of Idaho, state of Montana. All right, we are actively cloud seeding right now. And this is not just for climate, a lot of it's for water resources, but cloud seeding is happening and it has a, a, a both a water and a energy component to it. Um, other ways that we are trying to increase the flux of carbon down into the geologic system uh, that we'll talk about today, one is biochar, all right? And this is, in essence, similar to what Wendell was talking about. It is thinking about how do we do, um, how do we manage the biological reservoir to try and lock more carbon up into the soil? We'll talk about fertilization of the ocean, all right? And trying to increase biological productivity in the ocean. And then we'll talk about um, carbon capture and storage. So physically capturing carbon and injecting it down into the geologic system. All right, so the, so the first one that uh, we'll talk about is, is iron fertilization of the ocean. And this is, this is, um, this <clears throat> technique is of great interest because if we go back here, we can see that the net flux of carbon down into a deep reservoir so here, this arrow with two, the o this is the ocean flux of carbon into the, uh, into the deep ocean. It's a lot bigger than the soil carbon flux. Um, it's 100% bigger if we take the maximum soil carbon flux. So this is our biggest carbon sink by far, the deep ocean. So we're trying to figure out how to increase that deep ocean flux and let's do that by thinking about the carbon or the biological carbon cycle in the upper ocean. All right, and the basic idea is that carbon out of the atmosphere 
enters the water and basically gets locked up into various little organisms, plankton, right? And those plankton uh, and algae get uh, die and then they sink down into the deeper ocean, right? And that's the basic idea here. And so if we want to increase the flux of these dead animals down into the ocean, the idea is that we would fertilize the ocean, increase the production of these organisms, and therefore the rate at which they're going and uh, dying and falling down into the ocean, deep ocean. So the idea is that we come in here and we fertilize um, with many of the uh, fertilize areas of the ocean and try and increase productivity. And the main way we've been doing that so far is with iron because the limiting nutrient in many of these ocean systems is, is actually terrestrial nutrients such as iron. So we go out with a ship, we pour iron all over our ocean surface and then we try and get a bunch of these um, induce algal blooms. So we're actually trying to induce algal blooms out, out here. Um, so in a way this is, you know, linking our biogeochemical cycles um, to our climate cycle and our, and our major nutrient cycles to our climate cycle. Um, all right, I would say that this technique right now is mostly being done in the experimental phase. So we're trying it out and seeing whether it works. And sort of mixed results at this point. Um, and I think people are are thinking that it's it's time to move, you know, this isn't going to be a real answer at at very large scales. So another way that we can that we can try and lock more carbon up into into soil um, and and the geologic system is is by somehow getting it um, increasing the amount of carbon that's staying in the soil system. All right. So here, um, one of the ways that this is being done is this uh, product called biochar. So biochar um, is basically charcoal, all right? And we produce it not usually by fire, but by what's called pyrolysis. And it's essentially heating up organic material in an oxygen, uh, free environment so that um, you don't combust it, but you turn it into charcoal. Um, the bottom line is that you end up with charcoal and that you add, you amend soil um, with charcoal. So you can take, the idea here would be, is that um, agricultural systems would use their plant waste to create biochar and then they would amend their soil um, with their biochar. And essentially the thing about charcoal is that it is really stable form of charcoal or sorry carbon. It doesn't get broken down very easily and so when you add it to your soil it stays sequestered in the soil for a long time. So this is a branch. I'll, I'll, both of these mechanisms here, the fertilization of the organic or of the uh, carbon pump in the ocean, and then this biochar, these are what we would call biological methods. And so here we're trying to utilize organic carbon and organic carbon cycles to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and down into the either the deep ocean or the geologic system. 
So has anybody heard of either of these methods before? I'm going to take silence as no. No, I haven't heard of either one. <laughs> so, um, so these are things that are actively being done. I worked uh, as a postdoc in Australia with a group that was doing a lot of work on biochar and biochar is becoming more and more um, commonplace. You can go buy biochar at Home Depot now and you can amend your soil with, uh, with, with biochar um, that was produced via pyrolysis. So <clears throat> right now this is becoming commercialized and it is starting to, um, we're starting to see a bit of an increase in uptake in terrestrial carbon, I'll say that. Um, over the last five to 10 years, we're seeing the net terrestrial carbon sink increase. Some of that is biochar, not all of it. Uh, probably a small portion of that is actually biochar. But the idea of increasing the amount of carbon in the soil um, is actively being used in many places. Okay, so we can, we can sort of work with the biological system or we can be more, I'd say, uh, active and try and lock carbon up into the deep geological system. So this is a, um, a part of the carbon cycle that I've done a fair amount of work in. Um, at the national labs and and so carbon capture and storage is this idea that we would capture carbon um you know the the first figure we looked at said we were going to pull it out of the atmosphere probably not going to happen the most likely thing we'll do is capture it at power plants because that's where it's really easy to capture it and in high amounts um, and then we will find areas in the deep subsurface where we would inject it, all right? And the idea is that we would be very deep and isolated so that as we inject the CO2, it's not gonna migrate back up to the surface and be re-released. And it turns out that that's the rub. So. Um, a lot of the research in this area is figuring out where we could actually put it, where it would stay. So can any of you guys think of places where, um, where we have lots of carbon that's been locked up for a long time in the deep subsurface? Anywhere where it's like, where it already, I mean, you kind of said it when you asked the question. So like where we would find somewhere where it has been stored there for a long time. And then we can say it's probably would stay there for a long yeah, time. Yeah, okay, exactly. So but like, so just like a, what is an example of one of those places? Like where, where have there, where has there been carbon locked up for a million years in the subsurface? In like, in coal strip? Yeah, coal seams kind of are a potential one, but even more- or like the point deltas? Okay, so deltas are a good place to do some of this uh, locking it up in the sediment cycle. But if I bury a delta, all right, and come back in a million years and I'm an oil and gas company, I have oil and it has, locked up it's been down there in the reservoir in the oil and gas reservoir for a long time so a really good place to think about adding co2 is down in depleted oil and gas reservoirs these are structures in the earth that were capable of holding uh gas natural gas 
A lot of them have a lot of CO2 and oil, all right? And they're what we call structural traps. So they have some kind of tight rock, like a shale, and beneath it, they've got a reservoir rock. And, um, and they held oil for, for millions of years. So, the, so one really good place to put these things is deep down in these depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Okay, another one is, is deep coal seams. Um, coal, as it turns out, will absorb a lot of CO2. Um, it's part of its carbon chemistry, that charcoal that essentially that coal is, will absorb a lot of CO2. Um, and so this is another really good spot to try and inject um, carbon. Um, and then another place that we're doing it is in deep saline aquifers where uh, we're down thousands of feet and, and down in really salty water where no, you know, no human's going to be producing that water. It's way too salty. And um, the fact that it's salty and that salty indicates that there isn't any connection to fresh water systems or the meteoric uh, water system. All right. If it, if we had fresh water migrating down into these aquifers, they would be fresh, but they're really salty. And so um, it sort of indicates a long term residence time sink. Okay. So this is, I would say, uh, certainly in the prior sort of eight years. Uh, this was a really active area of research. Where could we actually do this? Um, we've started some pilot plants where we are actually injecting CO2. There's, I'd say each country, right? Well, each major developed country has at least one pilot project of CO2 injection. Um, the US has several. Probably the place where there's the most CO2 sequestration in the United States is in enhanced oil recovery. And so the idea is that you go to one of these old oil and gas reservoirs and you flood them with CO2. And as you do that, you push oil, the remaining oil in that reservoir to the production pumps. So it's kind of a, uh, an interesting way and probably the most economical way to do this is to try and use it to produce something that's used to be worth value. Right now, it's not worth anything, but it'll be worth something again. And um, and you would pump this CO2 down in here and then push it, push oil towards a pumping well. Um, so this is, I'll say, I would expect this kind of research and this kind of job market to be something that geo, geo, geologists and geoscientists We'll be working on um, in the future. For sure, in my career, I've worked on several of these projects, and um, and I think it'll become more common. Um, and so again, this is this one is something that we are you know we're actively doing it. It's not to a huge degree, but we are definitely. Um, we are definitely doing carbon sequestration via deep injection. Okay, so the other way that, that we can, that I wanted to discuss that we're actively doing geoengineering right now is by cloud seeding. So who, has, any, has anybody here heard of cloud seeding before? Yeah. Yeah. And do you know that we're like the state of Idaho is actively cloud seeding right now? No, I didn't know. So, so in fact, the state of Wyoming is currently suing the state of Idaho for their cloud seeding because the state of Wyoming is trying to cloud seed and they're not getting as much snow as they think they should. So you're going to, there's a, not only are we actively cloud seeding right now, 
we're doing it to the extent that different states are suing each other um, for the effect on their water resources. Um, so this is being done actively at various different scales. The idea for climate control is that we're going to increase the amount of clouds. And clouds are really good reflectors. Um, and so as we increase the amount of clouds, we're going to um, reflect more light. But then we also have huge effects on the water cycle potentially. So um, I just wanted to, uh, to talk about a paper that was just published a couple years ago um, and uh, in 2018. Uh, Precipitation formation for orographic cloud seeding. Okay, so we've been actively cloud seeding for a long time. Uh, I think probably the last 50 years, 60 years. But it wasn't until like a couple years ago um, that, we, that we actually had a paper that proved it was working. So people who worked in the industry, of course, thought it was working, but we didn't have any kind of real proof. So, um, so, this paper in PNAS. So the other thing I wanted to tell you guys about is this is the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And this journal is like, um, there's nature and science are the two top science journals. And then just beneath that are the proceedings of the Royal Academy of Sciences. That's uh, in Britain and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that's the US. So this is like, bottom line, this is a really high profile journal um, and, and one that's like, you know, supposed to have really high impact scientific results um, and, and things that are of very broad interest across disciplines. So you might be a hydrologist or an atmospheric physicist or a climate uh, person and this paper would be of, of great interest to you because um, it's talking about whether or not cloud seeding is actually working. Um, so if you go on and you want to go on and be a scientist, this journal, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, if you want a paper in it, be a really good idea. Um, okay, so. These folks were got a bunch of funding from the National or the National Science Foundation NSF to do an experiment, but importantly, their money was basically just to monitor current cloud seeding, um, current cloud seeding that's ongoing by the um, Idaho power companies, um, and why. Oh, why is Idaho Power cloud seeding? What do you think? Why would Idaho Power be interested in cloud seeding and in paying lots of money to cloud seed? Is it a terrain issue, sir? Um, it's not a terrain. They're going to. Idaho Power is doing it in a, a certain location that is a rugged terrain for a reason. Do they want more snowpack for irrigation? Okay, close. It's the power Skiing? company, though. Oh, okay. Is it for hydroelectric reasons? Yeah, exactly. So they're trying to increase their hydroelectric stores, all right? and increase the amount of snowpack they have to fill their reservoirs and make sure they can produce water. So this is an example, you know, of a, of a corporation or a, a, I don't know what they are, a utility. Um, that is, they're paying big bucks to cloud seed right now. And they're doing it every year. And so the idea here was, um, these folks knew that that Idaho Power was cloud seeding, and what they wanted to do is to see whether it was actually doing anything. Um, and so, the, I, here's the basic description of their 
um, of their experiment was to set up some really high resolution uh, radar and watch as the cloud seeding plane flew back and forth across the mountains and see whether they could see some, um, some evidence of the cloud seeding. So the way the cloud seeding happens is the, those winter storms track from east, or sorry, from west to east across Idaho. And here in the Payettes, they're coming across uh, Eastern Oregon, it's really flat. And then Idaho, you start to hit the mountains and you get a bunch of orographic rise, all right? And the idea with cloud seeding is that you're gonna put in a, uh, a particle, it's usually silver nitrate, um, and it has a similar structure to water. And what it does is serve as a nucleation point and you freeze the water around the silver nitrate. And um, it causes that super cooled vapor to condense into, and to form clouds. And the idea is that you do it at this temperature, I think it's like between negative 10 and negative 15 degrees C, where clouds aren't very common, but if you instigate cloud formation, it's cold enough that they'll grow. And so the idea is that you, in the plane, you drop this silver nitrate and you induce cloud formation. So they had this seeding, these cloud seeding aircraft down here, right as the mountains sort of rise. And then the idea is that they're gonna use radar to look really high resolution radar that's only come online in the last decade or so to look at, look at the structure within the clouds and see whether the cloud seeding worked. Um, let me hold on I got an extra what just happened got something in the way. All right. Okay, so here is the high resolution radar um, images and what you're going to see. So uh, these little flagpoles, these are um, wind direction and speed. All right, so they point, the long axis points um, in the direction of the wind and the number of these um, lines here indicates how fast the wind is blowing. Take home message here is the wind's blowing. Um, they got a Southwest wind past the Packer John mountain and up into the mountains here. Um, and it's at a reasonable speed, all right? Um, okay, so the idea, remember, is that they would go in and they would fly the plane horizontally here um, before Packer John, and that the cloud seed uh, areas would then migrate with the wind speed up into the mountains. And, um, and so what you see here is really distinct, like uh, each panel here is starting at different times. All right, and so this is the very first image and you see just little tiny dots all right there are no real clouds and you see just tiny dots probably right where they had just seeded and then as time goes on you see these lines coalesce into strong areas of reflectivity or clouds and even some precipitation um so here is a cross section. So now we're looking from Packer John out across the storm. All right, so you're looking um, from the ground surface up. And again, they're increasing in time. And what you can see is these red plumes. These are the cloud seeded plumes, all right? And they are, this is precipitation. So they are causing these storms and snow squalls. Um, from where they seeded the, the clouds. All right, so really 
you know, pretty cool and very definitive evidence that the cloud seeding is not only working, but causing uh, precipitation. So an interesting point here is that for like 50 or 60 years, we have been cloud seeding without anyone actually showing conclusively that it worked. And so here is the first paper showing that it is actually working. All right. And, you know, having a pretty strong effect and causing snow when you wouldn't have had it previously. So this is this, the cloud structure with no cloud seeding. And there is no, there is no precipitation here. No snow is falling. And if you cloud seed, they're getting real snowfall. All right. Okay, so this method will not only change our hydrologic cycle, but it will change our energy budget. As we shade, we're causing more reflection um, by adding clouds to the system. So cloud seeding, I think you'll, you'll see will become a much more widely used and contested method of climate control both from the water resources aspect and from the, uh, and from the uh, energy aspect. Okay, so we have just a couple minutes. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Do you think that geoengineering and global climate control is something we should be doing? Like, how's it make you guys feel that Idaho power is artificially increasing snowfall on the payettes? Uh, it's worrisome sometimes. I, I, it's the same thing like when we were talking about the aquifers, you know, we're, we're drawing water from aquifers, but it's not getting recharged. And you have second, third, and fourth order effects that are causing problems farther down the line. Yeah, I mean, that's what Wyoming's saying. Idaho's taking this water out of the, out of the air that would have come to us previously, right? So that's why you're going to see interstate suits <clears throat> one of the things that's interesting is is you know prior to this paper idaho could have easily said well it's not working we don't know that it's working we're just doing everything we can and uh and now they don't have that defense anymore they're definitely pulling water out of the system from cloud seeding Yeah, I don't know. I kind of agree with Mark, um, but I don't really know. It just seems like a pretty big question. Yeah, um, it is. It, it's a huge question. I, I want you guys to grapple with that. I mean, first of all, I want you guys to realize that you are, we are currently unwittingly engineering the climate. So it does seem to me like maybe it's worth thinking about ways to have, a, have an impact that, that benefits us. Um, right. But I also know that we tend to be very short-minded about our the way we think of things. So, you know, Idaho Power just wants more water in their in their watershed in the payettes. That's all they're thinking about. But they they may not be, you know, properly thinking about ramifications of their of their actions. And so many of our like the problems that we have associated with the environment are tied with like social problems um, and like, I don't know, inequality problems that if we just target the like, I don't know, just with the scientific solution or with geoengineering, we might forget about how these problems like generate inequality. So we just skip over kind of that half of the issue. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, 
there's lots of inequality in global climate change, no matter how you spin it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, certainly you have to be pretty rich and powerful to pay someone to fly a heli fly a plane around and drop silver nitrate in the air, you know. The uh, the major company um, that does this cloud seeding, their company name is Weather Modification Incorporated. And uh, just as a total aside, I think that might be one of the coolest company company names ever. Man, we we modify weather. <laughs> Pretty cool. I don't know. We'll see. It scares me a bit, but um. But it's happening. Okay, so we've run out of our time here. So um, I hope everybody has a good weekend. Um, just some business. Uh, next week, Andrew will lecture Monday and Wednesday, and then Friday, we'll um, we'll have some uh, we'll sort of close up class together, and then we're gonna um, make sure there's time for you guys to fill out some online um, surveys. So we're in the process of figuring out exactly how to do that. But, um, but we're getting some online surveys, so you'll, you'll be able to review the class as well. All right, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'll say that we can uh, have a good weekend. Thank you, Peyton. All right, guys, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you later.